Yes, uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, what my opponent doesn't know is that I won this battle a long time ago because when actually Wolfram called me and asked me to give uh, this debate, he, uh, I was supposed to give the pro date, uh, the pro part, and I said, well, I'm happy to come, but uh, you may change me to the contra part, so that's what he did. So <laughs> that's life. That's life. Shit happens. So, but um, so, so one thing I think we have in common, um, uh, because that's what we start off, and I think one important part is uh, that we couldn't live with these toast criteria anymore. And as um, also the previous speaker pointed out, they were not really useful because a lot of people are keeping keep on citing these criteria. But uh, if you look closely to what they say, which a lot of people don't do is actually that the definition of cryptogenic stroke is really uh, really useless because it actually consists of the one that we would use uh, no defined cause de despite uh, uh, defined diagnostic workup but it also consisted of two others no complete or no workup at all and two op more possible causes i think one really complicated uh, part is the, is the last one, which uh, really makes it impossible to work with these definitions. So um, we co completely agree on one, on one point that defining a diagnostic workup um, was a step forward and redefining the criteria is certainly a step forward. But what we also agree on is that it was not enough and the diagnostic workup that, uh, that needed to include, as you may know, was a TTE 20 hours ECG, or in the definition 24 hours ECG uh, in the trials, it was uh, uh, 20 hours uh, enough. And, and then uh, you still had only one uh, 12 lead ECG, 24 holder ECG, no TEE. And at the same time, and that's something I asked my cardiologist to do without TEE to exclude something like endocarditis and, and all that, and you all know uh, that that's really problematic and probably one of the most important results uh, of the trials that uh, we were just shown was that the recurrence rate in all arms was uh, was high with five percent in all arms and uh, I'm trying to make sense out of that in the next uh, in the next slides and there are two questions whether the is uh, the ESIS concept is really useful and uh, one is actually does it help in diagnostics and one thing we always discuss uh, does it identify patients with an underlying atrial fibrillation? And the second most important one is obviously, does it guide uh, treatment? So coming to the first, um, it's important to notice that uh, ESOS is not about atrial fibrillation at all, a a alone. It's, it, it's about uh, diagnos diagnosis of, oh, sorry, how can I go back? Uh, diagnosis of, uh, of atrial fibrillation. But if you implant those patients, th those are, retrospective data from the Presley F uh, trial, you actually find in ESOS populations, and those are recalculated to the ESOS calculations within Crystal AF, uh, you will find 16 to 20 percent in the first year to have atrial fibrillation. And um, we actually also did uh, meta-analysis of all trials uh, that are available. This is uh, not published yet. We had 25, uh, 25 trials with almost uh, three and a half or three and a half thousand patients. And as you can see, there's actually comparing ESOS patients and cryptogenic stroke patients, there's no difference in rate of detection with a p-value of 0 0.2. There's no difference in timing of detection of atrial fibrillation in these patients, and also no difference in the need for monitoring uh, to, to detect first atrial fibrillation in these patients. So actually, it really, this new definition doesn't help identifying patients in, within cryptogenic stroke cohorts uh, um, that have a higher yield of atrial fibrillation if you do continuous monitoring. And then the second question, obviously, uh, obviously we have to uh, ask each uh, ourselves uh, also concerning treatment is if you detect a first episodes way out after a stroke, um, we, we really have no idea yet uh, what uh, the, uh, what the uh, meaning is for, for the index stroke uh, and what kind of uh, risk actually those patients uh, carry. Do they carry the same risk as you were in primary prevention or secondary prevention? And if you are honest to ourselves, we don't really know the exact stroke risk in patients detected 
uh, with atrial fibrillation detected only uh, by continuous monitoring. So this leads us to the next question. Um, it's, it's not about atrial fibrillation, and that's one really important part concerning treatment also. There are also some other uh, subgroups within these uh, definition that have other causes that need a completely different treatment and are neither treated uh, sufficiently by uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, by oral anticoagulation or platelet inhibition. And I think the main danger in con defining such a minimal consensus uh, in ESIS is that in the future, we don't look at subgroups anymore. We, we just say, well, it doesn't matter anyway. Everyone gets, uh, gets oral anticoagulation anyway, so uh, why bother looking at these patients? And that, uh, in this uh, in the same time, leads to an unacceptably high uh, recurrence rate. So uh, now go, to, uh, go further to the treatment, does, uh, to the question, does ESOS help us try, uh, guide therapy? And you already saw the, uh, the main uh, trials. I just want to point out that in uh, the Navigate trial, 50 milligrams uh, per day were used, so not the full dose of uh, anticoagulation, and you already saw the, um, uh, the data in the previous talk, uh, no sign of efficacy within the first uh, uh, one year, actually, and uh, an excess of bleeding, and uh, once going to the, uh, to the uh, subgroups, you see there's no, not even a hint of a superiority in ESOS, uh, in Navigate ESOS uh, for oral anticoagulation at the same, same times. Those are the major safety endpoints. You see uh, almost three-fold three excess of bleeding in these patients. And uh, that's the respect ESOS. I was uh, told uh, not to show the graphs because they're not published yet. But what is uh, presented is down here. You see the primary endpoint um, of the trials. Um, and, uh, you can see that it's 4.1 against 4.8, so there's also uh, no, uh, no, no real efficacy um, uh, issue here. And regarding safety, uh, you will see the data down here, um, and there's no difference, no statistically difference in Dabigatran uh, versus aspirin. However, if you look cl uh, closely, this difference, this, that seemingly difference in tri trial results between the two trials actually arises from the aspirin arm of both arms. As you can see in the Navigate ESOS trial, the aspirin arm had a complication rate of 0.7. That's good buyer aspirin. They have a huge experience with aspirin. And then in the Beringer Ingelheim trial, uh, you see almost double or double less high complication rates in the aspirin arm. So the only difference in safety arises from the, from the aspirin arm, which uh, I think raises another set of uh, new questions. Just a few uh, thoughts uh, at the end. Um, I think uh, for us, uh, looking at the, uh, at the ESOS concept from a different point of view, it doesn't really look well for us as vascular neurologists. Many of the medical disciplines actually try to have personalized medicine at the same time. It looks like uh, we as neurologists try to get rid of one of the two uh, approaches that we have uh, because we cannot handle two of them. And if you look at the theoretical uh, point in, in ESOS, if you have only patients with atrial fibrillation and you put them on oral anticoagulation, um, all of them will profit, uh, will benefit, and a few of them will uh, have harm because of bleedings. Um, so there's a huge difference in the situation of ESOS, which is still a very unselected cohort of patients, especially with such a minimal workup. And if you anticoagulate all those, you have some who have cancer and have endocarditis that you don't detect at all that need complete different treatment. You have some of them who are now uh, treated worse because they probably would have needed platelet inhibition. Probably for the main part, it doesn't make a difference. And then you have some patients who are, uh, who are better off. And even if that would be positive, I think that's not the final thing that we want. We want to have that personalized and have uh, the patient treated with the needed treatment. And then some other thoughts is obviously uh, we have no idea what that would have may, uh, caused in the general population, especially in the older uh, patients, if they, like, uh, for example, have a median femur fracture. This is a patient un, uh, under a dual therapy who fell and uh, a lot of fun operating on those, on those patients with this hematoma in there. 
and it's not about a stroke at all, a stroke alone, and we already heard the combination therapies are a problem. Uh, about 40% of patients actually in the pivotal anticoagulation trials are already on, uh, on combination uh, uh, therapies, and if you think one step ahead, if you anticoagulate from eases and you're not really sure whether this, this patient will really benefit, and he has a different doctor who thinks he should be on platelet inhibition, I think there will be a lot of patients, or would have been a lot of patients actually on combination therapies that are actually harmful for these patients and not really needed. And we know that these complications matter, even the significant non-life-threatening bleed uh, pay, uh, peep, uh, hemorrhages are meaningful. And if you go back to the old data from the WUS trial, and we saw that the triple therapy actually had an excess of bleeding that was quite uh, understandable, but at the same time we, already, uh, we also had an excess in stroke and also uh, embolic and, and ischemic events, and I think this is well explained by this picture I received from my cardiologist from an ADC or seven-year-old patient with an acute coronary syndrome um, on triple therapy, and everyone can ask himself, whether would, uh, you would continue with anti-thrombotic treatment in this patient. So I come to the conclusion, I think, I, uh, I'm also on the same page. I think the ESIS uh, uh, concept will be here and stay because I think it's a step forward, but it really needs adjustments and I think it really needs more diagnostics whenever uh, needed. We need better and high quality diagnostics, 5% recurrence rate are way too high in these uh, populations and we need to do more research. I have to uh, also say that in, in, uh, at the World Stroke Congress, the PFO data was discussed. There's no sign uh, whatsoever on, a, on, a, on an effect in the respect ESOS trial, so this raises another, con another discussion uh, on, on these topics, but I think we urgently need, um, uh, need research in these, uh, in these uh, areas. Thanks.